Welcome to the future and you. Ideas and opinion about the future based on verifiable facts of today. This episode is for December 16, 2015. I am your host, Stephen Ewan Cobb. This is the 10-year anniversary episode of The Future and You. The very first episode went public on December 15, 2005. To celebrate this milestone, we will cover a futuristic topic never before discussed on this show, micro spaceships, specifically sending them to explore other star systems. Our guest today is Dr. Philip Lubin. Recently, I've begun working with the Tennessee Valley Interstellar Workshop. The TVIW is a nonprofit organization dedicated to thoroughly exploring the science and engineering that can eventually open up the reality of interstellar travel. I'm helping them to create a new monthly video series called From Here to the Stars. My part is to interview a guest and then transform the interview into a completed soundtrack for the video by adding an intro, outro, and music. Recently, I interviewed today's guest for one of the TVIW interviews. But after the video interview was over, he still had many more fascinating things to say. So we talked for another 35 minutes. Today's episode features that additional material. If you enjoy space exploration, and especially the possibility of interstellar exploration, check out the TVIW YouTube channel for the new series which is called From Here to the Stars. We intend to add a new video every month. The first video, featuring Mark Millis, is already on YouTube. The second, featuring Dr. Lewis Friedman, will go up soon. And the video featuring Dr. Philip Lubin is scheduled to be the third video. Dr. Philip Lubin is a professor of physics at the University of California, Santa Barbara. He is a NASA Institute for Advanced Concepts Fellow for his work on laser-beamed energy micro spaceships. Before we jump into the interview, let me give you a rundown on the material that we discussed and he described before the, uh, this portion of the interview, uh, which you can find in the uh, video I mentioned, the video series, From Here to the Stars, episode, uh, I believe, number three. What he's talking about is uh, mostly micro spaceships. And the uh, micro spaceship can be described as uh, approximately a one gram wafer with sensors and electronics, but very little else. The propulsion system is not included in the spaceship itself. Instead, the propulsion system is an external device, an orbiting series or array of lasers. The exact arrangement is probably described better in some of the papers that he refers to, which I believe are publicly available on his or the university's website. They've done a great deal of research in this area. And he also describes um, larger versions of the spacecraft. The propulsion system is that the laser aims at the wafer, and the um, wafer acts as a tiny solar sail so that the light from the laser hits the, the backside, so to speak, of the wafer uh, and propels it forward. The longer the light is bouncing off of it, uh, its surface, the, uh, the more acceleration it will it'll receive. And of course, the stronger that the, uh, uh, the laser uh, beam is pointing at the wafer, well then again, more, the more acceleration based on the uh, arrays that they have described in their papers uh, using a one gram wafer, 10 minutes worth of propulsion would be sufficient to bring the thing up to approximately one third the speed of light, which means travel time to the nearer stars becomes uh, more reasonable. Uh, we waited almost 10 years for the probe that we sent using chemical rockets, of course, to Pluto uh, to arrive this last summer. And so if you can get something that will arrive at uh, another star, say in roughly 10 years, uh, that would be acceptable by human planning, those who plan space missions. We know this because this is how long we've waited in the past. Uh, Alpha Centauri is, of course, 4.4 light years away. At one-third speed of light, it would take uh, about 13, 13 and a half uh, years to reach there. These would be fly -by, a flyby mission, um, let's see, what else can I tell you before we get into the interview? Um, at the end of the video interview, I asked him, um, well, if they're being launched so rapidly, if they would require only 10 minutes worth of propulsion, I would imagine that you would send many instead of just one. And he said, oh, yes, we anticipate sending tens of thousands per year. 
basically an expanding cloud of micro spaceships leaving our own solar system in every direction to study all the nearby stars. That is an exciting, uh, an exciting prospect. Uh, one other point he makes is that the spaceship doesn't have to be of only one size. So that while the, they're focusing uh, a lot on the one gram sized spacecraft, they also studied larger craft, say one that's uh, a one kilogram or a hundred kilograms, or even large enough for a human being to ride in. This wouldn't be useful, of course, at this technology level for interstellar travel, uh, but instead it would be uh, useful, perhaps, within our own solar system. And he uses as an example, if you had one propulsion device at Earth in Earth orbit and one in orbit around Mars, the transfer transport time to Mars for a um, a one or a hundred kilogram uh, unmanned spacecraft, let's say basically you're doing FedEx work, uh, shipping, could be a few days or a week, but transport time for a human being sized uh, craft might be one month instead of what it is currently, which is um, over half a year, just to do a simple home and transfer ellipse, uh, which is right now the most uh, energy efficient method uh, from Earth to Mars. But that takes um, well over half a year, somewhere around nine months. And I think that's enough foundation to give you uh, the entry point uh, for getting into uh, this, this portion, this second portion of, uh, of Dr. Philip Lubin's interview. So without further ado, here's the interview. This is doable. What we've been trying to point out to not just NASA, but you know, many other communities, including DOD communities, is that you know this this could be done. This is not just uh, an imaginary pipe dream. You know, we now possess the technology to to do this, and we we lay out a roadmap, which is you start small and work your way up, and you know just try to iron out the many you know bumps which are going to occur along the way, because it is not a simple thing to do. Mm -hmm. But it, um, on paper, and in all the discussions we've had with people, no one has said it will not work. And we've talked to lots of technical people. And I, my preferred choice is talk to people who are very hard hitting and ask all the really, really hard questions, which is why I talk to a lot of my DOD friends and you know other scientists who can ask me, what about this? What about that? Have you thought about coherence length issues? Have you thought about you know metrology? And you know, have you thought about you know this and that absorption on the reflector? Blah blah. You know, it's um, all the great questions I love mm -hmm. uh, to talk about. Well, I have one you might not like. <laughs> oh, go for it. <laughs> Uh, I was talking about this with a, a buddy of mine, and actually it was my mother now that I think about it. But she said, well, once it got near a star, the probe is so small, you know, talking about the micro, micro spaceship, how would it send information back? How would it, you know, have the energy uh, to send a, a signal back? And, and, of course, I didn't have the answer for it because I didn't re looked into that part. My worry was what instruments would it be able to carry? But... I would think sending information back would be a tougher constraint. Give your mother a big hug. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Today's her 80th birthday. I'm I'm going to her party. Well, would, would you give her a hug for me <laughs> and okay. tell her, you know, those are the kind of questions I just love, you know, which is how are you going to get the information back? So, mm -hmm. um, I, I'm assuming she's probably not a, a science no, oriented person. Not really. Um, but in our 50 page roadmap paper, or maybe it's four, yeah, it's 40 or 50 pages, I can't remember. Um, uh, we actually discussed that in great detail. So the, it, the smaller the, the spacecraft, the, the harder it is to do the communication system, as you might imagine, mm -hmm. um, just because you have less room for, you know, it, if you might imagine an optical system of some sort, um, and you have less room for power systems, and you know, it just gets harder and harder. Um, however, so we, we look at the case of the smallest system we're currently envisioning, which is a wafer sat, and show that a, a wafer sat at a distance of Alpha Centauri um, would be able to communicate back to the Earth um, using nothing but its wafer um, as the laser communication system. We, we, we look at, looked at radio systems early on, but decided you know, that's hopeless, um, at least in any realistic format. Um, but laser communication is not hopeless. So we, we look at the, the issues, and you might want to take a look at the paper, or, or um, we'll discuss it during my talk. And we, we do a lot of uh, 
uh, signal to noise calculations in our group for other purposes. I'm I'm a cosmologist. That's what I do for a living. And this the stuff I'm talking to you about is more just more for fun. Um, so I'm very um, very adept at doing you know S and R calculations and looking at backgrounds and um, receiver noises and stuff like that. So the 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 key is the uh, receiver uh, is actually the same as the the laser transmitter, which pushes the object. So it can be run in reverse. So you have this very large um, directed energy system which pushes on the spacecraft. And when you turn it off, um, it can actually receive the signal coming back from the spacecraft in precisely the sort of time reversed uh, mode. Or instead of photons going out, they come in. And so that's the key. Um, the, the spacecraft itself has a relatively puny um, laser communication system. In the case of the wafer sat, we we burst uh, a little less than one percent of the time a, a one watt uh, signal, um, which is directed back towards the Earth. And so there's a you know, there's a star tracker on board. Um, uh, there's a, a way to keep track of where you're pointed, uh, which is one of the many elements on the on the wafer, um, and it's oriented with with photon thrusters, which is kind of cool. And you can actually um, it's l low enough mass, you can use the uh, photon thrusters to orient it, and for small course corrections. Um, and if you, if you work out the co to noise calculations, which we do in the paper, and show you know, plots of you know bit rate versus distance, um, you can still communicate. So the other related question your mother might ask um, is, you know, how are you powering the spacecraft? <clears throat> so it turns out that the uh, two ways to do that that, that we think are realistic. <clears throat> the baseline approach is to put a very small RTG on board, a, a radio isotope thermal generator, uh, much like is on the Curiosity on Mars and is on the Voyager, by the way, um, except that it would be an a, a extremely small version of that, way much less than one gram. It puts out only about uh, five to ten milliwatts of electrical power. <clears throat> you store that on board. Uh, and then you burst out a, a small uh, burst of um, of uh, laser communications. And, uh, you know, when you work out the math, which we do in the papers, um, and you use the laser ray, which was used to push the device out, but now use it in reverse as a receiver, you can collect enough photons coming back to actually... Um, you know, receive information. Now, the data rates are are modest, but they're sufficient to get um, you know Im imagery back. You know, a, a related question that you might want to think about is: people often ask me this. Um, you know, what happens when you get there? And that's a, actually a really hard problem. Um, I've been scratching my head on that one for a long time. You know, how do you? It's not. I'm not worried so much about the imaging part, which which has its challenges because you're going so fast. But the you know people would like to go in orbit around the you know possible exoplanet or at least the the star. The problem is you're going so fast that to slow down and go into orbit is not currently on our agenda. So as I often say to people, that's not my problem. <laughs> that's, that's that's somebody else's problem. Yeah. But we've we've seriously we've looked at all the things we can think of for slowing down. You know from. Uh, using the star's light to push against us and slow us down, that doesn't work. We looked at using the um, sort of the e-sail approach but in reverse. That doesn't really work in a practical way. We've looked at mag um, sails, and that doesn't work. Um, and, um, you know, kind of run out of options. You know, the photon thrusters don't work. Uh, so I don't, uh, I don't actually have a, a realistic solution, you know, People have said, oh, let's just use an e-sail or a mag sail. And, you know, I said, let's do the math. And and unfortunately, when you do the math, you realize that this object is uh, going so fast and has so much kinetic energy, which, by the way, that one gram little spacecraft has the kinetic energy of, guess what? The same as the shuttle in orbit, hmm. uh, about a about a kiloton, so it has the <laughs> kinetic energy of a tactical nuclear weapon. Mm -hmm. So you just better bet it doesn't hit an advanced civilization that's going to get pissed because you just declared war on them. Mm. Um, but it would actually burn up before, if it was an atmosphere like ours, it would just burn up the atmosphere. Um, 
but yeah, so s realistic stopping um, uh, is something I really thought hard about. And for the smallest devices, I don't have a solution. Larger um, devices um, can extend booms out and things like mag sales um, become more interesting, but still extremely problematic when you look at the real math. I mean, they're nice to throw the around the words, but I don't like to throw in words if I can't back it up with mathematics in a discussion like this. And when we do back it up with mathematics, we realize, you know, this just isn't going to work. Mm -hmm. Now, inside the solar system, it's a different situation. So one of the one of the other uses of this technology is to uh, rapidly transit back and forth in the solar system. Um, the way that you would do that in a practical way would be to ping pong. And this this is a really hard thing to do um, technologically, but could be done in theory. So if you built two of these systems, say one you know, at the Earth or on the moon and, and one uh, in orbit around Mars, which would be hard, but it could be done in theory. What you do is you would, you know, sort of shoot yourself off uh, from uh, near the Earth, and then as you approach Mars, you turn on the other one that slows you down, um, and then you can go into orbit. Um, that's a futuristic sort of variant. Works on paper, um, and uh, you know, it is one way to kind of think about a interplanetary uh, rapid transit system. Um, and again, sort of the beauty of this is you. You, you amortize your cost into the main driver, which is the directed energy driver, and you only have to you know, basically build one of them, on, at least on each end. Well, let's say we built one, the Earth and then Mars system. What would be the transfer, transfer time for a human being, not just a, a little package like you know, FedEx or something? Yeah. Um, it's of the order of a month um, for a human uh, scale craft. Uh, 100 kilograms gets to Mars in about three days. Mm -hmm. um, so Voyager get to Mars in about three days. Um, but you want at least 10,000 kilograms for a human craft, 10 tons at least, and probably more like you know 50 to 100 tons. Um, and that takes a order um, uh, three months or so. So are we talking about a, a craft that's about the size of the International Space Station? Um, well, you could. I mean, again, you, you can propel anything, and it's just a you know you have to trade off speed versus um, you know versus mass. Um, I'm trying to picture as opposed to say the Apollo uh, 11 space capsule carrying three men. You know, they never get out of their chairs the whole trip. Right. Um, so you know. F f for, for things like NASA's envisioning for going to Mars, it's kind of a, a hybrid, you know, between the Apollo capsule and even, you know, the Orion capsule, if you want to think of that as the mo modern variant of Apollo. Um, sending something like the ISS, which uh, has a mass of about half a million kilograms, um, is, is probably overkill for um, initial human voyages. You know, I, I would be happier with something maybe could hold 10 people and this is something we've we've just looked at briefly you know say 100 ton class vehicles which you know are pretty good uh, size of the um, 100 tons would be 100,000 kilograms versus the ISS in total is about uh, 500 tons 500,000 kilograms so you don't need something quite as large as the ISS um, you know, but getting to Mars rapidly is is a is an issue because you'd, you'd like to minimize the transit time. So if you could reduce it down to a month, say from a year, um, and you could you know send them out uh, frequently, um, well, relatively frequently, not every ten minutes, um, you know that would be uh, still of great interest. And <clears throat> and you know as I mentioned earlier. This technology is scalable. So the numbers I'm quoting are actually for what we call a DE star four system, which um, is a large system, but you know not a planet scale class system. <clears throat> but you know as 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 we get better and better at at building things in space, um, we could I could imagine we could build larger systems. So in our papers we actually discuss this. You know how it scales with with the uh, size of the uh, launcher. And, you know, if you could, in theory, um, build something that can get you to Mars in a day um, with human beings on board. But 
you know, it's a significantly larger system than we're talking about, although it's the same basic technology, you know, just have to scale it up to, to larger sizes. Um, the same system also, um, if you look at our website, there's a whole section on planetary defense and, you know, other things you can do with the terraforming, et cetera. So the same system could be used for uh, planetary defense can be used for um, orbit modifications and uh, asteroid uh, capture and all kinds of other interesting things, including terraforming. Uh, there's some uses on the Earth where you could possibly um, modify uh, storm patterns. And it's one thing we've looked at for a while, you know, could you mitigate storms um, before they became deadly? So this, this is a kind of a transformational technology, you know, something that uh, should be uh, thought about, uh, mostly because we're at the point in our technological evolution where we could do this. Um, and because we could do it, we should think about starting along the roadmap to do it and then see, you know, what the problems are. And there, there will be problems, no doubt. And there, I, mean, I could tell you <laughs> hundreds of problems <laughs> with me. Okay. But... But it's not an imaginary technology. That's the difference. You know, if you, if you go to most of these conventions, which you, I'm sure you've been to a few, and you listen to the talks and someone gets up and talks about a cork drive or talks about, you know, wormhole drives or wormhole, you know, links or, you know, antimatter drives or, you know, uh, nuclear propulsion, you know, is one thing people often talk about. But when you run the numbers on nuclear propulsion, it just really doesn't work um, because you got to carry all this stuff with you. And. That's a, a really, really tough thing to do. So they talk about, you know, fusion um, and then, you know, run the numbers, which I keep telling people, sounds great. Let's do the math. Um, and then usually most people I talk to say, well, I don't know how to do the math. <laughs> okay, well, fine. But then why are you proposing this? Um, and so if you look at something like, you know, Project uh, Daedalus and, you know, the Orion, Project Orion, you know, they're talking about enormous spacecraft, you know, most of, most, most of which is not useful in terms of carrying the people. The people parts are, are you know, is tiny. Most of it was, you know, fuel and, you know, um, you know, whatever, in the case of Orion, you know, shields and stuff like that. Um, and so, you know, we're taking a totally different approach here. If someone wants to know more, learn more about your work, about this kind of project, this specific project, where would they uh, where would they go online to learn more? All right, so we put um, most of our papers are on our website. Mm -hmm. um, they you know can just Google us, or um, our main website is www.deepspace. One word, just like it sounds deepspace. UCSB for UC Santa Barbara. Edu. And then you'll see on the front page uh, an area of projects, and um, you know, it won't take you very long to find the uh, interstellar work um, as well as the planetary defense stuff. Um, and the uh, the roadmap to interstellar flight is is there as well. You know, so they, they could read about it. There's there's a very some very long papers that I've written, and, um, as well as with our students. And there's there's all kinds of interesting stuff there. Most a lot of it's very mathematical. Um, but there are some pretty pictures in there as well. Okay. There's also some interviews. Um, there's a SETI interview. Um, we've done some work on the implications of this for SETI, which are actually quite profound. It turns out that if you take this technology and shine it outward as a beacon, it can be seen all the way across the entire universe. Mm. Um, and conversely, if there was another advanced civilization out there, we could see them even with modest telescopes on the ground, by the way, across the entire universe today, which I've um, been talking to my SETI colleagues, we've started a, a little search for this, but, you know, it brings up an interesting question um, uh, uh, in terms of, you know, okay, so where are they? Mm -hmm. um, but you know, whatever, it, it, it's something where I, I hope people at least open their eyes and, um, you know, kind of put on two hats. One is, the hard technological hat, which they may not wear at all. Okay, fine. But at least try to understand the technolo technological implications that are now implied by this, because they are really profound. I mean, really, truly profound. Um, 
and as and people are very used to, let's just build a bigger rocket. But you know, realistically, I mean, ask your audience, you know, who are old enough to remember the early 1960s or late 1950s or you know whatever, and maybe even look up you know World War Two. You know, the rocket technology has not evolved significantly in over a thousand years. Um, now, of course, we build bigger rockets, but the the propellant is still basically the same as it was over a thousand years ago, i.e. it's chemical reactions shooting out, you know, the end of a pipe. Um, and while we've got better at building, you know, big rockets, um, but they're not that different than gunpowder rockets. Um, now I know it's gonna, that's going to be a horrible thing to say to some of the Bill's propulsion systems. Um, <laughs> but it's true. <laughs> but it's true. It's just simply true. You know, it's, it's just reaction kinetics mm -hmm. um, from chemical reactions and chemical reactions. Yeah, chemical energy is far insufficient compared to the scale of magnitude we need. It doesn't, yeah, it just doesn't get you where you would dream of going. It's great for getting into low Earth orbit. It's great for getting to the moon, and it will get us to Mars. But, you know, if you look at some of the recent studies of, you know, how do we get out to Pluto faster, you know, than Voyager got out? Well, maybe we can get it maybe factor two fast, you know, shorter time. But, you know, that's... That you know, go back to the early 1960s and look at the rockets. It's we haven't evolved in 50 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, very much. You, you know, I I don't mean that in a in a derisive, but you, you got to be honest and say, um, if you really want to go interstellar, I mean, your workshop is an interstellar workshop. You know, it's not an interplanetary workshop. Um, you know, it's not how do we get to the moon again, you know, before the Russians, which I was thrilled to see that the Russians are, you know, are planning to have a, a human base on the moon. That's wonderful. I wish the North Koreans would do that. I wish the North Koreans would go to Mars. You know why? <laughs> Just yeah. guess why. Because we would go too, and we'd probably try to beat them. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It's the only thing that's going to get us off our butts, you know, mm -hmm. to do something. Competition is healthy, even when it's a little scary. Yeah. So I, I, I'm, I'm for a mixture of, of, of doing things. I'm, I'm all for very conservative, very, um, I hate to say the word, um, you know, mundane, but I will, um, you know, technologies that are uh, tried and true and, you know, get us, you know, down to the local store. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you want to take a long trip, it's just not going to work. Mm -hmm. um, and you got to be honest about that and say, okay, let's take some of our money and invest it in, um, you know, really different but viable technologies that have a profound transformational impact. And I don't use that as just some stupid word, you know, that NASA loves to use. It's transformational. Oh, great, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, truly, these things have you know, vast implications. And what's stopping us? We are stopping us. You know, the technology is not stopping us yet. Um, it's we who are stopping. We have to have the vision to say, you know, let's start not by, you know, blowing the bank on this, but let's put in, you know, some uh, realistic money to start and let's see where the problems are. Mm -hmm. And let's try to solve those problems because on paper, when you look at our papers and there's there's a lot more in some of the technical documents to discuss, you know, you know phase problems, coherence problems, metrology problems, you know, that stuff I really enjoy. Um, as much as I like to talk about this with you, what I really enjoy is someone who, who gives me a new problem that says, have you thought about this? Said, Shoot, no, I haven't thought about that. Man, let me sit down and work out the issues. You know, so one of the things I've been doing re recently is looking at what happens when you are going along the way and you, you know, you hit a dust particle, you know, at 30% speed of light. Well, you that, know, that would be catastrophic. <laughs> it's like space debris. Um, well, it depends on the size of the, of the dust particle. Um, so I looked at the you know distribution function for space uh, for interstellar dust, and it turns out it's not catastrophic. Um, mm, okay. So the latest version of my paper, which is not on the website yet, goes through the 
um, issues related to that. And so I think we can deal with the um, normal interstellar dust. Now, if you happen to hit an asteroid going out, game over, you know, sorry about that. Mm -hmm. um, might be great for blasting apart asteroids, but because um, you're hitting with a kiloton. But um, one more reason to send many rather than one. Exactly. Right. So we're putting the money into the launcher, which you built one, and not into the spacecraft, of which you built many, and you, you replicate them in mass production. Um, now, when it comes to people, it's a totally different issue. You know, well, yeah. we're, we're very risk adverse to killing people, but we're not risk adverse to killing wafers. There is no society for the protection of wafers currently. Mm -hmm. um, that might change when silicon life forms come, you know, to to being, but so far no one's getting upset with that. Yeah. So I don't, when people ask me about human missions to the stars, you know, I, I really, I, I, I really start a discussion with them about why do you want to send a human to this, to, you know, interstellar distances, you know, and I ask them to think carefully about that. And then usually the answer is because, and then it's because why? Well, because, you know, I read it in the book, you know, I saw it in the movies, it seems so cool. Yeah, okay, that's all great. So let's do the math and look at the issues. A typical human is not the proper life form, in my opinion, to send to interstellar distances. We're too big, we're too inefficient, we're just not um, appropriate. We weren't designed for that. And look at the support systems that we require. You know, you, if you just look at what you require to, to live one day, <clears throat> you require a minimum of a kilogram per day of support food and liquids. Minimum. You know, um, so now, you know, you look at some of these ideas for sending out wor world ships. You know, I, I was just at the 100 YSS, which is the 100 Year Starship Convention, because my, uh, one of my, my friends is uh, Mae Jameson. And she's very nice. She, I really like her. Um, and she asked me to give a talk on, on our stuff because she, she's actually been very interested in, you know, looking at realistic ways of getting to interstellar flight. But, you know, a lot of people there want to send out, you know, 100,000 people on a, on a starship. I said, okay, cool. Let's do the math. Um, and, you know, when I start doing the math for people, it's like, uh, get this guy out of here, right? He's a total bummer, you know. <laughs> It's totally depressing, you know, mm -hmm. which is, you know, which is true. And it's the same kind of thing I'm going to talk about at, you know, at your convention, which is we got to do the math. Um, and, and a human is really a bad, uh, a bad thing, a literally thing to send out to the stars because we require huge support systems to do what? You know, our body is not the important thing to get there. It's our intelligence. It's our sensors. You know, our sensory. It's our perception. It's our thought processes. You know, and we got to think seriously about um, you know genetics and how we would evolve a life form which carries the essential human element but does not carry around this huge clunky body which is basically useless. I mean, look at yourself. You know, look just. Like, look at all the appendages and, you know, and, and and things that are with your body. They're useless. Sorry about that. But, you know. <laughs> I'm feeling kind of self-conscious now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I know. But I, I do it all the time. I look in the mirror and say, what a useless hunk of biological crap, you know, to send out to interstellar distances. It, it really, um, it, it, first of all, I don't think it makes sense. And then when you really do the math, you start thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Um you know, you, and you really run the numbers of the sort of energetics required. And I did this at the 100 YSS. And, you know, it was a total bummer for people, of course. I was like, get this guy off the stage right now. Uh, <laughs> he doesn't fit our paradigm, you know. Of, and I said, okay, I understand that, guys. But let's at least see the precursors for human flight to the moon mm -hmm. were robotic missions to the moon. Precursors to Mars are robotic missions. So we should see the same as the precursors to interstellar flight. All robotics, except the problems are vastly more complex for humans to interstellar distances. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I don't want to chew you too long, but it's a major issue for me, and I, I'm trying to gain some traction with people, but I know it's depressing for well, them. Well, so. here's my take on, based on what you've said and what I've heard from other people, is that 
um, we're, as far as the stars go, traveling, exploring the stars, we're now in the point where human beings are looking at landing on the moon but have never flown anything in space. And so the idea when we were talking earlier about flybys and could we slow down and you know go into orbit around a, a, a planet on orbiting a different star, well, in the first missions to explore the moon and beyond that, they didn't try to slow down. They didn't. They would crash into the moon or they would fly right. past the moon. Right. They'd, exactly. And so flybys. So I'm per completely comfortable. I'm completely comfortable with not slowing down when we get near another star. And the other part is, uh, no one would. Even though everybody, you know, there was science fiction at the time, you know, the early 50s and late, you know, 40s and such, when uh, envisioning people going to the moon, but the engineers that were actually going to do the missions, they knew, okay, we can't send people. If we can just get a machine to go past the moon, we will have made a major achievement. And so we're not at the time where we should be thinking about sending people into, into to other stars right now. But 10,000 years from now, yeah, we'll be all over the place. So, yeah, and, and I don't think it'll take 10,000 years, frankly. Um, but, but I think that the discussion should be a logical discussion. Otherwise, you'll turn, you know, the potential funders off. Yeah. Because, frankly, uh, I'm sure you've gone to enough conventions to know that many people walk out of there who are hardcore scientists shaking their head and say, I'm never coming back. Oh, yeah. Because these people are great at dreaming but they have no idea what they're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, they have no idea how to get there. They have no idea um, how to accomplish what they're doing. They're all they're doing is just dreaming and nothing else. Mm -hmm. And and I don't want that to be the case. You know, I love um, less as you know, just enthusiasm. His combination of hardcore, you know, scientific input as well as you know dreams mm -hmm. so i i really would like people to see this in a in a positive way to say i love dreaming as much as you love dreaming let's continue to dream mm -hmm. <clears throat> but while we're dreaming let's also accomplish let's try to accomplish the dream not just by dreaming but by working towards realistic goals so that I don't want to stop the dreaming at all. Mm -hmm. What I do want to do is stop people from turning off, you know, the other people who could be supportive. Because if you turn off the government, which many of these people have already turned off the government a long time ago, right? And you, you turn off investors, you know, you just say all these are is a bunch of science fiction fans who, you know, want to go to Comic-Con and dress up, you know, like Darth Vader. They don't, they're not really serious. They have no, you know, propulsion system to accomplish any of this, you know, this is, there's nothing here, you know, go home. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's, I think, the, one of the serious problems you face um, in this community is that until you get serious about what's possible technologically, you know, how, how would you, would you really get anything to the stars, any human thing to the stars? Until you can address that, you can't really, um, you know, get people excited about doing it. But once you do that, then you can get people excited about doing it. And then they'll be supportive and they'll, they'll dream with you. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a major issue for me is that, you okay. know, I, this is, for me, this is a mission. This is, I mean, a, a, you know, my own mission is to help people understand what's possible currently technologically and what's not possible. Now, by not possible, what's not possible is part of the problem. Is that I'm not saying that things are impossible. I'm saying they're not currently possible or not currently feasible. Let me use that language. Is if you want to send a world ship with 100,000 people on it, which is what you know some of these conventions are about, that's great. But you know, show me on the paper how you're planning to do that. Um, otherwise, you know, there's nothing to talk about, and and, and this is the problem. You know, is that uh, it's like going to Comic Con. I take my son. The Comic Con, you know, I love it. It's great, but you know, do I think that you know whatever creature someone's dressed up as is a way for me to get to that you know exotic place? No, I don't. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, you seem like a very logical, reasonable person. Um, and then Les, of course, very much is so. And then Les has been very supportive of what we're doing. He's you know encouraged me to um, you know engage people. But but I think if if I can get people to stop and think, and not I'm not trying to turn them off at all, but I'm trying to actually turn them on to a way to actually accomplish this, and not to suppress their 
dreams and, and desires and visions, but to help accomplish them. And um, it, it is much like you say, we're in the early days and we need hardcore, you know, you know, no nonsense people to start looking at how we would really do this. So, yeah, I agree. Yeah. yeah My so. take is that we need both the, uh, the hard science people and we also need the dreamers. And sometimes they're the same people, but sometimes they're not. The dreamers give us a vision of where we can go or where we might want to go. And uh, the hard science people are the ones that will try to actually, you know, make it work. But both are vital. Yeah, and, and you know, many scientists, many students, um, I teach for a living. You know, many of my students are drawn to this for in, internalized um, emotional reasons. You know, it's not because they've thought through the problem at all. You know, when, when physics students come to me, almost inevitably it has nothing to do with the mathematics. It has to do with this, wow, these guys are working on, you know, interstellar flight, you know, and there's, or, or planetary defense. Uh, you know, I get, literally, I've had, on this project alone, we've had more than 50 students working on it because they see something, there's some, there's some spiritual part of them that says, wow, I would love to be a part of this. I would love to enable this. And then they get into the, you know, mathematics of it. But what it t tracks initially is not the mathematics. It is the, the dream. Um, but I'm trying to help them by saying, this is a great dream. Let's see if we can accomplish this part of this dream and then evolve. Um, because eventually we will, you know, be getting people out there and then, you know, be developing, you know, radically new technologies, which are different than this one. Doctor, I sure appreciate you taking the time for the interview. This is awesome stuff. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. You have a great day. You too. Say hi to your mom for me, please. Okay. Oh, I will. I will. That was Dr. Philip Lubin. You can learn more about today's topic using the links I've placed in the show's blog post, which is located at thefutureandyou.libsyn.com. Libsyn is spelled L-I-B-S-Y-N. That's it for this episode of The Future and You. This program is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivative Works 2.5 license. A copy of this license may be viewed at creativecommons.org. Briefly, this means you may, indeed you are encouraged to, copy this entire program as many times as you wish and give it away to as many people as you wish. But you may not copy only a portion of this program, you may not charge anyone any amount of money for it, and you may not use any portion of it to make something new. On the other hand, anyone whose obvious goal is to recommend the show to others automatically gets special dispensation. Offline reviews, which include the show's website, may include brief quotes. And online reviews, such as for a blog or community group or web page, which provide a conspicuous link to the show's website, may use as many quotes as they wish, up to and including a transcript of one half of any interview. The show's theme music is a blues number called Some Sympathy by Chris Jurgensen, and is from his album Big Bad Son, which is available at magnatune.com. Magnatune is an independent record label that sells its catalog of music through online downloads and print-on-demand CDs. The company allows artists to retain full rights to their music and splits equally with an artist all the revenue from the sale of their work. All the music at Magnatune may be previewed free of charge and customers can even choose how much they want to pay for the music with pricing ranging from $5 to $18 per album. You can learn more about them at magnatune.com. That's spelled M-A-G-N-A-T-U-N-E dot com. If you have a theory or opinion about what the future will contain, be it the near future or the far future, you may email it to me at thefutureandyou.com. That's M-E at symbol thefutureandyou.com. You may also suggest topics that you would like to hear discussed or send contact information for experts that you feel might provide valuable insights into the future. Mind you, an expert is not necessarily someone with an impressive degree. The best experts are the people who live or work or strive in the area under discussion. If the subject is science or medicine or academia, a degree is important, 
but if the discussion concerns trends in construction or firefighting or video gaming, a degree is pretty much meaningless. To get the inside dope, you've got to find the people who actually do this stuff every day. They are the first to see the trends because the trends have already begun changing their lives. As to the topics we will explore in the next episode of The Future and You, I can make no guarantees. Interviews are still being sought, recorded, and edited. All I can promise is that we will ruminate on the future. To learn more, check the show's website at thefutureandyou.com. If you enjoyed the program, please mention it to a friend, and be sure to join me again next time. Until then, I have been your host, Stephen Ewan Cobb. On behalf of myself and all my guests, I thank you for listening.